raise your hand. I can some of the folks, I can see some people along the side of my screen, but not everybody. So if I don't see you, just speak up and say, hey, I got a question. Um, so in preparation for today's um, education session, I thought it would be great, you know, Catherine and I sort of talked a little bit about the fact that as a walk leader, as a volunteer, some of you may already, you know, have a family member or have cared for a family member or a friend with dementia. And so I think, you know, when we come into any session or any education session together and we're learning, there's always that prior knowledge and um, lived experience that we have which is really, really important. So by all means, in our session today, please feel free to you know, share some of the, the insight that you have on dementia as well. Um, and I'll be asking you, you know, what some of those symptoms may have been for those of you who do have a family or a friend or colleague who have had dementia. So in preparation, we thought, well, you know what? We use these infographics that I would have sent out. Um, Catherine sent it out to you in, e in an email. This really kind of gives a visual. I know we all learn very differently. Some of us, we, you know, we we need to do things. So we're more practical, hands-on. Some of us are more visual learners. So I thought that would be kind of a great way to to get to know some of the symptoms. And then, of course, uh, there was the video that we would have created at the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia. Oh my gosh, it's probably been about several years now. Um, so you would have met Anne McQuarrie, Sandra Britton, and Faye Forbes in the video. And that was the 10 symptoms and strategies video. I think it's important when we're learning about dementia to learn about the experience of the person who's living with dementia. How better to learn about a disease and its impact than actually hearing from the person who's living that experience. And so um, we decided at the society, you know, we had these amazing people who wanted to share their experience and they're advocates for themselves. They're also advocates for other people uh, living with dementia. And so we broke down each one of the symptoms that you see on the infographic and, and the women talked about those um, and how they experienced those. And so for the, for the ladies in the video, uh, they're all from the Halifax area. And um, the reason why I bring this up is because Sandra is actually an avid hiker. She's hiked to Machu Picchu. She, uh, and this after diagnosis, after diagnosis of Lewy body. So, so getting outside, exercising, walking, hiking is imperative for people who are living with dementia. And so that's one of the things that we say, you know, like, what do you want? What can you do to reduce the risk of dementia? How can you live well? Walking, exercise, getting outside is one of the key ingredients to that. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into the, um, the, se the session here. Um, so we are gathered together today on sacred land that has been the site of human activity since time immemorial. We are in Mi'kmaq, the, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation, the past, pre present, and future caretakers of this land. I'd also like to recognize and offer gratitude to African Nova Scotians and their ancestors whose histories, legacies, and contributions in 50 communities for over 400 years have enhanced the part of Mi'kma'ki colonially referred to as Nova Scotia. Today, as both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, we commit to the responsibilities of seeking harmonious and mutually beneficial relations in keeping with the relationship outlined for us seven generations ago by our ancestors in the Peace and Friendship Treaties. Looking at um, what we'll discuss today, we'll look at what dementia is, we'll talk about the symptoms, and also um, I think one of the most important things, you know, if you happen to have a person with dementia in your walk or on your walk participating, how can we communicate? How can we um, better understand the impact that the disease may have on them from a, an abilities perspective. And then of course, looking at ways to support people. So when we think about dementia, um, dementia is really a broad term that describes a set of symptoms that are caused by disorders that affect the brain. And so with dementia, dementia is really progressive. And I think that's one of the things that when, when we hear about dementia, we don't necessarily think of it as being progressive. We hear of certain symptoms, but with those symptoms, if 
for instance, for Alzheimer's disease, there's different parts of the brain which are impacted. And with Alzheimer's disease, it's the temporal lobe. So that would be this section of your brain here, which controls our memory and our language. And so for a person with Alzheimer's disease, the first clue is that there may be something um, changing is a person having difficulty finding the right word, or maybe they're forgetting birthdays or anniversaries. It's because it's the temporal lobe. It's that part of the brain which is impacted. Um, but eventually, because it's progressive, although it may be one part of the brain, it begins to um, reach other areas of the brain. And each part of the brain controls different functions. Um, so when we're looking at trying to understand dementia, yeah, it, it's important to understand what type of dementia it is um, in the sense that we can have a better understanding of what the, the changes and abilities will be. We know that there isn't a cure yet. There are medications. Some medications can actually um, help with um, memory. Some medications can help with some function, but they are, they are limited. They can, they can assist for a limited time. Um, and so we know, as I said earlier, you know, exercise um, is one of the biggest things, one of the greatest things that a person can do to maintain their um, to maintain their health in the earlier stage, mid stage of the disease. So, um, and, and I think there's some confusion too around Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And so, just to kind of make it a little bit more clear, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease and dementia, sometimes they're used. The two terms are used. Um, inclusively, I guess you could say. They are different. Um, and, and so it's an important to realize what the difference of that is. Dementia is not one specific disease. It's a broad term for a set of symptoms caused by physical changes affecting or physical disorders affecting the brain. So we hear more about Alzheimer's disease because it's the most common type of or the most common cause of dementia. And it represents about 63%, 64% of the um, types of dementia that are out there. Um, so if we think about it, Alzheimer's disease is a specific disease, while dementia is a general term for a group of similar diseases. And so there are a variety of different causes of dementia, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. All right. So here we've got a, a little infographic here, and we often refer to um, dementia as an umbrella term. And that's basically because it is more of a general term. And in the community, you may hear people saying, well, hey, you know, my mom has mixed dementia, or my, my wife has vascular dementia. My doctor says I have dementia, but no, no specific cause. My dad has Lewy body. Then we've got somebody else saying that they have a family member with frontotemporal lobe dementia, and then of course Alzheimer's disease. So when we think about mixed dementia, um, a person can be diagnosed with mixed dementia. And so for this individual, they may show symptoms of at least two different types of dementia. And so usually with mixed dementia, it consists of the two most common causes of dementia, would be, which would be Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Um, so for a person with mixed dementia, they may show symptoms, of both Alzheimer's disease and vascular. So with Alzheimer's disease, you know, there may be changes um, in their ability uh, to, to, well, their memory and language. They may also have some difficulty with mobility. They may have some paralysis. Um, so because many symptoms overlap between different types of dementia, it can be hard sometimes to figure out exactly um, whether or not a person has mixed dementia. The one thing that's important, however, is to understand that if they have a combination of two different types of dementia, the brain is being impacted in, in various ways. Um, so this can affect how the person progresses through the disease itself. Some of the other types of dementia, which you may be familiar with, vascular dementia can occur. Um, and I say can occur if a person experiences a stroke. Not everyone who has a stroke will um, go on to develop vascular, but some people will. So it's that blockage of blood flow, the oxygen to the brain um, with vascular dementia. Lewy body is another type of or cause of dementia. And with Lewy body, the hallmark characteristics of Lewy body um, are really these proteins which will develop in the brain, but there's hallucinations. A person will begin to experience or see things or auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations. 
Um, frontotemporal lobe is another type of dementia. It affects the frontal cortex, which really controls sort of our behavior, our personality. A person may begin to say things or do things inappropriately where before they wouldn't have. Um, it's because that part of the brain is impaired. Um, so there are, if, if we think about the number of causes of dementia, there's over 90 different causes of dementia. Um, so, so this is not an exhaustive list of the ones that you see on the screen here, but, uh, or of the ones that I may have mentioned to you. But just to note that there are a variety of different causes of dementia. And I'm just going to check through here to see if anybody's hands are raised. And no, I don't see any. Um, so now before we jump into what some of the symptoms of um, dementia are, just, oh, I see, yes. Um, I see I'm his. sorry, I'm still, my screen is still stuck on. My wife has vascular, vascular, mom has mixed. It's yeah. Not, it's not rotating. Is there another Sorry. No, that should be there. You have the umbrella with the people? Yes, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Before we get into the symptoms, I'm not jumping in there. <laughs> I'll get in there. So just out of curiosity, you know, for those of you in the room, in our virtual room here today, what were some of the initial changes that you may have noticed in, in your family, your friend, or your neighbor that had dementia? Um, my um, grandfather... Um, became angry in a flash and would hit out at nurses or whoever was attending to him. Mm -hmm. He also was forgetful because um, he put a pot on the stove and it caused a fire, it caught the curtain. Um, he, yeah. he was trying to heat something or whatever. But Grammy passed away earlier from a stroke. And um, yeah, so those are <clears throat> two that I'm well aware of. Yeah. And, and so that really actually kind of brings up a really important um, factor, too, is that everybody's very individual, right? How a person will uh, progress through the disease is as individual as you and I are, because they have a different lived experience. They have a different way of coping with change, with transition. They may have other medical conditions, which may complicate the way they are sort of... Um, you know, uh, living through the change or the experience. And so, yeah, forgetfulness is one of those, you know, it's it's not being able to retain information. It's like it's there, but they don't have, a person doesn't have access to it. So forgetfulness can be, you know, memory changes in memory, also sort of um, changes in mood and behavior or personality. And so where a person may have not been quick to anger, all of a sudden now they are. It could be because that part of the brain that controls or regulates behavior um, or, or emotion is impaired, but also it's frustrating because that person, one of the other symptoms is the inability to express how, you know, express language, what it is that they might need, what it is that they, they may require, and they may not be able to ask those questions, or it's comprehension, not understanding what it is that we may have asked them to do. So yeah, so there's two, you know, really great examples there. Leslie, it looks like you might have. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, for my mom, she'd been a teacher. So it was um, very um, obvious when she stopped learning new things. So they could even be simple things like, uh, so she and I, we moved in together and uh, she could never remember that the dish soap does not go in the dishwasher simple things but kind of funny in a way but but little things like that simple things but if they were new things she just couldn't retain that information and her behavior changed in the way that she became very um fearful of the outside world she didn't want to go anywhere without me there and uh it was almost like having a it's almost like a three-year-old that didn't want to really go out in the world without their mother. You know, it was kind of like that. So it was easy to take care of her. It's just she she wasn't the confident, uh, learned woman she had been. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's interesting that you'd say that because um, you said that she became fearful. 
And that's something, you know, so that's, that can be associated with anxiety as well, right? Knowing that things have changed, I'm no longer able to do the things that I used to be able to do. So because of that, even some people may fall back from conversations. They may no longer participate in conversations because it's really difficult to follow along with a conversation. I have one of my clients, he was at a family reunion and he said, you know what, Kara, he said it was so difficult as much as I wanted to check in with my nephew that I hadn't seen, you know, he was away in university because there were so many people in the room and there were so many other people walking around back and forth, different conversations going on. It was really difficult for him to narrow in and focus in on that specific conversation. You my know, mother it, used to say the same thing because I had four yeah. children and they'd get gabbing away at the table and she'd look at me and say, I don't know what anybody's saying. Yeah. And I would say to her, that's okay, mom, I don't know what the heck they're talking about either. And then we'd yeah. start up our own little conversation. Yeah, there it is, you know, and so so that's what we're looking at. And, and so if you happen to have people who are coming out on the walk who have dementia, it's to appreciate that if there are many people, you know, like walking and talking at the same time, if you have one person with dementia, maybe it's to, to have that one-to-one -one as you're walking together. Because it can be too, too overwhelming to have too many, trying to listen, you know, and for the most part, when you're out walking, there is that social aspect as well. Um, and depending upon where the person is, you know, they may be fairly early stage and they're able to follow along with different conversations. But, you know, if you're uncertain, just ask. And that's one of the beauties of, you know, like one of the things that I've learned so much, um, you know, with my work at the Alzheimer's Society is if I'm uncertain about something, I'm going to ask. And, and so you know, some of my clients were living with dementia. That's what they say, you know, like they, they say it can be frustrating. You know, I, I have one gentleman who said, you know, like he wanted to change the, um, the chain on his bike and he wanted to do it on his own. And he said, you know, don't, don't come in when I'm working on my bike and automatically try to take something and, and help me with it just just jump in he said ask me because the 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 thing about him and wanting to do the like change the the chain on the bike on his own he got so much satisfaction out of knowing that he was still able to do it and so he said when you try to take over that takes that satisfaction away from me and so for him it was really important you know offer the help offer the help most definitely because I can always say no but there's so much um joy and and sense of purpose in knowing I can still do this you know and so sometimes we think we're being helpful and in fact hmm, maybe we're you know we may be adding to some frustration because the person becomes more aware of the fact that oh yeah I am challenged with this but hey you know what she's seeing that I'm challenged with this so so by just asking if they can support as opposed to just sort of coming in and doing that, changing the chain for him. He said, no, I get so much value out of being able to do this. Um, so, so yeah, so I've just learned so much from people with dementia. And so looking at some of the, um, the comments here in the chat. So yeah, my grandmother really struggled with not being able to communicate what she wanted to say. Yeah, and that's just it, right? We get frustrated. Can you imagine if you were in another country with a different language, and, you know, you're trying to get from point A to point B and it's getting dark and, you know, like the frustration, right, of not being able to speak the same language. And if you can't understand what other people are saying or if you can't, you know, convey what it is that you might want or need, it can be really, really frustrating. Definitely. And uh, and like this this gentleman that I explained to you, he stopped participating in conversations. He said, he, I just sit and I would nod, you know, but. If somebody pulled him aside and sat down with him away from the noise and the distractions, he was better able to focus and concentrate. And then again, there's that loss of filter and that can most definitely happen too, right? So you're out at a restaurant and um, you know, the menu comes out and, and having too like so, so much on a menu, too many choices. And this is one of the things that we'll talk about later. It's not a good thing to have too many choices. If you know exactly on that menu, what your family member might, like you know if it's a chicken sandwich or if it's a steak whatever it might be 
then offer those two things up from the menu and offer to support them in that way. Um, because they may just agree to anything that you, you know, anything that the, the server may suggest, even if they don't like it. So the meal comes and then all of a sudden they're not eating it. Or they may look at the menu and say, oh, I can't read this. And they may throw the menu across the room. So there's that inappropriate reaction to, to not being able to, to get through that, that menu, right? Um, is, there, so is there any correlation somehow between Alzheimer's and ADD? Because a lot of the, I have ADD, ADHD, mm -hmm. and I find a lot of these symptoms is what I've been living with my whole life. Right. And so, you know, so even, even what you're saying about the menu with so many choices, I do just look at my husband and ask him, what do I get? Just order for me. Yeah. And, and so, so there isn't a correlation. However, what you're recognizing, Leslie, is how similar we can be in different situations and how different strategies can help with you know knowing that when you're opening up a menu okay this is too overwhelming for me so i recognize this now and this is what i'm going to do and so basically that's what we do with any type of you know any type of disorder or disease is trying to figure out how does this impact me and how now can i figure that a way or a solution or a strategy that works for me right and so basically that's what we do and and it's it's interesting that you recognize that because i also have a friend of mine who works with the um, Autism Nova Scotia. And when we talk about tips and strategies that we use for people with dementia, a lot of the strategies are very similar, right? So, so you will see some commonalities in our approach. And it's the same, you know, um, just recently at the Alzheimer's Society, we have a, a lead for dementia-friendly communities. And I guarantee you anything that we can do to make a community dementia-friendly will be friendly to all uh, people of different abilities, right? Yeah. So we we basically, I think we kind of went through a lot of those um, uh, different symptoms, but Alzheimer's disease, before we get into the symptoms, Alzheimer's disease, we talked a little bit about it. It's the most common cause of dementia. And it represents about, if you know somebody, somebody with a diagnosis of dementia, it's probably going to be 64% of the time Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it's progressive, degenerative, irreversible, meaning that, that once the symptoms occur and the changes begin, there's nothing presently that we can do to stop those. Um, and for Alzheimer's disease, we, we know that there's these proteins that will develop in the brain. It's amyloid, um, so amyloid and tau are some of the proteins. And of course, these proteins make it more difficult for the brain to do the work that it needs to do. Now, um, we don't know specifically, um, we know that there are certain risk factors that can contribute to dementia, increased risk factors. Um, and as far as a cure is concerned, there are medications that can help, as I said earlier, with symptoms, uh, but there's nothing that can really stop uh, dementia yet. But we're hopeful that something is coming down the pike and there's always research going on at any given time throughout the world. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful and we're hopeful at the Alzheimer's Society that they will be coming up with something. So we talked about, you know, what some of the symptoms are. Um, so no matter whether it's Alzheimer's disease or one of the other types of dementia, there are a number of common symptoms a person may experience. So again, it's important to realize that not all individuals will have the same symptoms and that each individual will have the same difficulties with those symptoms. And again, I'll say it again, you know, like everybody with dementia, they have their own unique strengths. They have, you know, they have the challenges, they have their lived experiences, they've got their personalities, they all have different coping styles, and everyone has a different support network as well. And so all of these things will play an important role in how the person experiences the disease. And so with our group, we, uh, we kind of together, um, we came up with what some of those symptoms are and the infographic that uh, Catherine would have sent out to you um, will provide more information as well. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on those right now um, as we talked about them. You know, we've got uh, memory loss affects day-to-day -day abilities. So we see a picture of a woman here and she's, you know, she's really struggling with trying to remember and using visual cues. Uh, and visual cues, cues are wonderful in helping people to um, remember things. I have a client actually who, when she leaves her apartment door, she actually uses uh, sticky notes. Um, she's got sticky notes on, on the door uh, before she exits. And on the sticky note, it says, remember your keys, remember your wallet, remember your notepad. 
And those are the things that she does before she leaves. Um, let me just check, I see something pop up in the chat here. Um, yeah, that's a good question. And let's let's go to that question at the end there, Pauline, if that's okay. Um, so the question is, um, would a group leader expect a caregiver or support person to be with the walker with dementia? So let's talk, let's talk about that um, toward the end. And I think those are the kind of questions that I think would be great to have. So I'm gonna whip through these really quickly and we can get back to those. And uh, if anybody has more questions about the symptoms. Um, so difficulty performing familiar tasks, problems with abstract or problems with language. So finding the right word, or you see the woman, she's got a cat in her hand, but she knows it's a pet, but she can't find the right word. Again, um, disorientation with time, with place, her judgment, problems with abstract thinking as well. Um, so not being able to use um, maybe a debit card or not knowing how much money to give to the, um, the, the, the cashier at Sobeys, let's just say. Other symptoms, um, misplacing things, changes in mood and behavior, changes in personality, and then lack of initiative. And this one is a big thing because this is where you will get the people who may really want to get out and walk, but because that part of the brain that initiates activity, it may be more difficult for them um, to participate in something like a walk. So then there, that is where that care partner or the family member who recognizes, oh yeah, well, dad really used to like to, he loved getting out and walking, but he had a scary incident once when he went to the barber and he couldn't orient back home again. So, so that may be the person who's connecting you and as walks to say, you know, what, dad really likes walking, but he's become fearful now because he doesn't want to walk on his own. So that might be um, something that will come up. And, and um, let, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, that initiative. So it's a lack of initiative. It doesn't mean the person doesn't want to continue to do the things that they love doing. It's just that the motivation, they need a bit of a nudge to get up and go to do those things. And this is just a quick, um, yeah, just sort of a, a shout out to the 10 symptoms and strategies video. If you haven't watched it, I definitely recommend watching this so that you have a better understanding of how changes can occur and how people living with dementia will experience those. And so of course, um, here we have an image of the brain. It depicts the different sections of the brain, provides a brief description of some of the functions. And so primarily, you know, when we think about Alzheimer's disease, the yellow-ish area here, this is the area which controls our learning, <clears throat> language, um, and feelings, then the frontal lobe, we think about the frontal temporal lobe dementia, which impacts a person's behavior, movement, executive function, being able to pay for bills, um, sequencing, putting things in order, the parietal lobe, language and touch, occipital lobe. And we do know that um, some people will have more difficulty as well as they progress through the disease with their visual spatial ability. Um, so again, they're, you know, so their vision, so the peripheral vision is impacted. So really important when you're interacting with a person with dementia to make sure that they can see you. Um, that face-to-face -face contact is really important. Um, and when you approach a person, not to come up from behind, but to approach them face-to-face. -face. And then of course, <clears throat> when we get into looking at communication, that's really interesting, you know, we know of the importance of nonverbal um, communication. Um, and Moravian was a researcher back in the 1970s who actually looked at the role of nonverbal cues in communication in the communicating of feelings and attitudes. And so he found in his research that if somebody's words didn't mesh with their facial expression and their tone of voice, people will believe the nonverbal communication, not the spoken words. And we know that ourselves. You know, if you're ever if you're having a really bad day. Um, and, you know, your friend, you walk into the house and your friend says, uh, you know, how was your day? And you're like, oh, I had a lovely day. The tone of the voice or the fact that you're taking your coat and throwing it over the banister and pulling off your shoes. Yeah, I mean, there's so much that can be said non-verbally, right? And people with dementia are very aware of changes in our nonverbal, in the way we approach, the way we enter into a room, our facial expressions, our tone of voice. Um, so just to be aware of that, um, that uh, the way we communicate is very important, you know, from a nonverbal perspective, our bo body language and our voice 
can convey so much more than the words that we use. And so for people with dementia, what becomes difficult, as we mentioned earlier, is following along with conversations, organizing what it is that they want to say, and then putting it into words. Um, and then so there's that being able to process and provide information to you to ask a question, but also understanding what's being said as well. And then some other changes which can occur for people um, is, is trying to find the right word, creating new words um, for words that have been forgotten. So if it's the remote control uh, in, in, you know, if a person refers to where's the thingamabob and then they use, started using the thingamabob to refer to the remote control for the television. Um, so it's knowing what those words are. So there's a switch up of words because that word that they're trying to find is too difficult. Um, focusing and attention. Reading may become difficult as well, um, and writing may become difficult. And then, of course, using judgment, which we talked about or we looked at earlier, it's judgment is re judgment and reasoning can be impaired. And people can begin to take things that you say fairly uh, literally. So if you say it's raining cats and dogs, for a person with dementia, it may be difficult for them to ascertain that, oh, it's just an idiom, it's something that we say. Um, so it's just to say it's raining really heavy outside today, you'll have to wear your raincoat, you know, your rubber boots, that sort of thing. Um, and then so before we get into, you know, looking at ways that we can support people with dementia from a communication perspective, thinking about some of those um, family members, some of those friends that you may have had with dementia, what were some of the things that you did? to support them when they were having difficulties. Feel free to add into the chat or unmute yourself, raise your hand. I was um, a youth, I would say, and it. I was afraid of him and I withdrew. Uh, oh, but you withdrew. Okay. I, I saw him lash out and um, it was not the grandfather that I knew. And uh, yeah, I was afraid of him yeah. at 12, and, whatever. At 12, yeah, yeah. And that, that, that's hard. So, so from a communication perspective, you know, when we're thinking about enhancing communication, one of the things that we can do is to learn more. At, at, at 12 years old, you wouldn't have had enough lived experience, you know, to, to learn. Um, but to be able to learn more about the impact and why a person may be frustrated. And then when we understand the why, it becomes easier to support that frustration or to come or to have an understanding of what might be triggering that that frustration, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, you have a, Jennifer, is it? Yeah, you have your hand raised there. Yeah, for me, for, for me, it was my mother and we were her primary carers in the end. But uh, when she would get really frustrated, or upset, or you could just see she was kind of, you know, just going to that place. We found that bringing her back by reminiscing about something in her past was a great way to kind of refocus her. She was a waitress in her younger years, and she loved to talk about that. So I'd say, tell me again when you were working at the white spot or something like that. And that would just completely distract her from that and bring her back. And she would be, it would, it would bring her out of that funk that she was starting to to go into yeah yeah really great and it's orienting like you said it's bringing things in um of interest to her and things that she's still able to talk about right her past and those are those remote memories those long-term memories those are the things that um people with dementia will remember and mm -hmm. and have an easier time in talking about and and you said you can you know you, you're able to connect with her where she is. And, and that's one of the other things too, you know, with dementia is sometimes we have a sense that, oh, we need to reorient them to what's happening now. But what we say is, you know, not to, not to correct, but to connect, connect with her where she is in the moment. So, you know, if somebody on your walk who's 80 years old or 75 years old, they begin to talk about their parents as if they're in the, you know, as if they're still alive you know that, wow, they probably died maybe, you know, 40, 30 years ago. But you know what, I, I probably, I can probably guess that, but what I can do instead of saying, 
you know, correcting them. Oh, well, you know, you're not going to do that anyway. Obviously, you're not going to say your father died many years ago. What you're going to say is tell me a little bit about your dad. What did he do? And then you can sort of, as you're walking, you can talk about dad and the things that he did and the things that he enjoyed doing. So it's connecting with them in the moment. Leslie, you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, I know when my mom lived with us uh, and I had uh, my four children at home, we got one of those little card things, you know, that you put on your table that start conversations. And my children learned a great deal from my mother with what did your room like look like when you were a kid or what was your favorite toys when you were a child or, you know, things like that. Like, what was your first date like? And oh. my kids got a lot of pleasure listening to their grandmother through, even though she knew she was in the present and not really able to interact with the outside world so well, it was a great experience for my children. As, as well, um, my 16-year-old daughter began living as a transgender male. This was kind of, my mother did not understand that, but my, my son would then explain and my mother would accept him. And then tomorrow he'd have to explain it again. But he didn't get upset. He'd say, you know, Nanny, I, I, you keep forgetting, but I keep explaining and you accept me every time. So it's one of those things where I think my children learned a lot of patience and acceptance through having their grandmother with Alzheimer's. And, and, and that's wonderful. Thank you. So I really appreciate you sharing that, Leslie, because as you said, you know, for your son, it's it. He, he knew, he knew that the next day that she would not remember. And so it was being patient and just taking the time that she needed and then going over the change that occurred, you know, and just repeating that information and being patient and giving her the opportunity then in the moment to process it, you know, and, and we do know when we share information depending upon, you know, where the person with dementia is in the, in the progression, it may take them several, like it may take them several um, minutes to, 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 to sort of process that information. It's going to take them a longer period of time. And, and if anything, you know, that's one of those big, the, the big things that we can just slow down, you know, give the time, be patient. Wonderful. And I think there, there was another person maybe who wanted to Oh, let's see the chat here. Let's see. I'm going to jump in here. Yeah, this is Bob. Oh, okay. So you got to jump out at one o'clock. Okay. So before, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he had shared that his, um, he's the caregiver for his wife who has uh, moderate dementia. Um, but yeah, and he has to leave for another meeting, but um he said, I need to get her out more for walks, but in a safe, in a safe understanding way. So understanding way. Yeah, exactly. And so, so those are the sorts of things that that's why we're here today, you know, is to try to understand how we can do that. And so hopefully if this goes a little bit over, you can watch the recording because it is being recorded, Catherine, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's jump through some of the ways that we can communicate. So thank you all very much. That was uh, wonderful. These uh, different ways that we can communicate um, our family and friends. And I really, in particular, Leslie, I like those little cards that you had suggested specifically for your mom. Wonderful. So when we're thinking about enhancing communication, obviously, you know, it's introducing yourself. That's always the first way to go. You know, it's just, hi, hi, Bob, it's Kara. You know, like I'll be, um, I'll be a walk leader today. And, and I often wonder too, um, and this is something that we can talk about, uh, Catherine, you and I could talk about, I wonder about name tags. Name tags can be really helpful as well. Um, speaking clearly, not speaking too quickly, um, not being too rapid, just you using simple language, um, using short, simple sentences. And then again, as I said earlier, really important to make eye contact, using a pleasant tone, not rushing, because if we rush, if we're trying to rush through something or, um, you know, a description of where the route is going to go, we want to take our time with that because it may take them a little bit longer to process it. They may have a question. Um, so some of the other things that we can do is being patient. So the person needs more time to process the information. So providing reassurance as well. 
if they're having trouble communicating, telling them that it's, you know, just encourage them to keep trying to put their thoughts to words. If you have a sense that they're getting frustrated, though, then um, say, we can get back to that. You know, we can talk about that when you're feeling up to talking about it, when that question comes back, showing respect. So again, using the person's name when addressing them. Um, and not using elder speak or not using the words like honey and those sorts of things. So avoid talking about the person as if they're not present. Sometimes that can happen if the care partner is there. Um, also looking at reducing distractions if you can, if possible. Listening and speaking to the person with dementia. And again, it's asking them what it is that they may require, asking if they may require some support, not the person that they may be going to the walk with. Um, and then offering help if you think that it's required. So supporting. So when we're thinking about supporting a person with dementia, it's, um, you know, it's knowing that all behavior, and this is from a behavioral, behavioral perspective, all behavior has meaning. Um, and it's never losing sight of the person and what they may be trying to tell you. And it's, again, it's using positive um, communication um, and respecting that it may take them a little bit of extra time to to communicate what it is that they may need to you. So when we're offering appropriate help, again, it's approaching in a friendly, open manner. Um, avoid making assumptions about what they can and cannot do. Um, giving detailed information, and maybe it's providing detailed information about the route before they come to the walk. Um, and again, I, I reiterate, making sure that you're speaking to the person with dementia, as well as the care partner that may be attending with them. Uh, and then as far as navigating unfamiliar places, um, and this is a wayfinding. This is not going to happen necessarily on your walks because it's going to be a planned route. But also having visual cues as landmarks are, are really good um, ways to help people navigate unfamiliar places. So for decision making, um, we suggest offering simple choices. As I said earlier, when, you know, if you're out in a restaurant, they open the menu and there's all of these different choices. If you know what that person likes, then by all means offer two choices as, a, as opposed to that plethora, a plethora of things that are in front of them. Talking slowly and clearly using short and simple sentences um, and then avoiding phrases that they may take literally. You know, it's raining cats and dogs, I'm up to my eyeballs, those sorts of things. Asking one question at a time giving the person enough time to respond to the question. Um, and then if they don't respond, giving them time to repeat, you know, maybe it's repeating the question or go back to the question again later on. Oh, yeah, so that's interesting. We learn not to ask yes or no question because the answer was always no. It's so much easier for a person to say no if they don't understand. And yes, that's true. So it's it's trying to be more direct with the questions as opposed to asking an open question. Open questions can sort of um, be more difficult for a person. But yes, yeah, saying no, if we offer too much choice is easier. Um, but if we can, you know, if we can ask a person, you know, like, would you like coffee or tea? Um, if they're always a tea drinker, you know, automatically they're going to say tea. So it's trying to simplify things as much as we possibly can. If the person doesn't understand, um, Jennifer, the question, they will probably say no, because no is easier um, to, to answer than yes. Um, so let's just flip through here. So support the person's reality. This can be really difficult for family members, I think. Um, so it's meet, meeting people with dementia where they are and accepting their reality. Um, reassuring the individual, being positive, remembering, as I said earlier, to connect, not correct. And again, you know, when a person begins to talk about something that has they've experienced in the past as if it's still occurring, we really want to meet them where they are as opposed to saying, you know, like, well, you know, your sister died 10 years ago. Just connect with them and say, hey, you know what, I know you had a really great, you know, great relationship with your sister. Um, what were some of the things that you used to do together? Was it shopping? Did you go out and go to the movie? So it's connecting with them where they are. That's really, really key. And they may only be able to connect on the things that 
um, were important to them as children or as you know young adults. Those are the memories that will be easier for them to pull pull in and have a conversation about. Um, and noting that what they did yesterday, they may not remember what they did yesterday, or they may not remember what they did a couple of uh, months ago. So connecting with them where they are, that's really, really key in supporting a person with dementia. And then, um, and I know that uh, Catherine has some different considerations as far as a walk, you know, what, to, what would be appropriate, you know, and, and the walk, um, you know, what's sort of um, already planned um, for walk routes with Nova Scotia walks. Um, these are all very similar, relatively flat route, making sure that it's accessible to people with canes and wheelchairs, lower traffic area, distance can be can vary, and that could be dependent upon the individual. Everybody's going to have different abilities. I had mentioned to you about Sandra, um, who, who's an avid hiker, you know, and so what she could do may be, you know, far greater than, or the distance could be far greater and more challenging than, uh, you know, a person that isn't an avid hiker. Um, and then again, you know, if there are accessible washrooms that are close as well, those are some of the things that um, we want to look into when we're planning a route. So what I'm going to do, the other thing too, you know, and I know this may not be possible, but when we're thinking about um, having people with dementia in a, a walking group or joining a walking group, it depends upon their abilities, but being aware of possibly having two leaders for the group so that one person is sort of leading the way and can point out some of the different things on the trail. And then another person can sort of be more in toward the back who can keep track of um, the numbers um, of the people within the group and can sort of, you know, guide people if they if they happen to stop and and uh, the other members are walking um, farther ahead. So I'm going to stop sharing this now so I can see all of you and get into some of our questions that we might have or, you know, any comments that you might have or any ideas that you might have. In the, uh, in the hiking groups I belong to, um, we call the leader the guide, and there's always oh. someone at the end, and they're called a sweep. A sweep? Oh, the, it's like curling, sort of kind of like curling. Sweeping everybody uh, like, the, like the clown at the end of a parade, you know? No, okay, I love that. Okay, there you go. So, so we're having a guide and having a sweep. Great. And, and um, I'm curious, Leslie, where is, where do you, where is your walk? What part of the province? I walk? did have a walk in Florence in Cape Breton, but uh, I only got the same two women and they wanted to go off and do a bunch of other things as well. So finally, after a while, we just let that walk stop. So um, I was thinking of getting involved in someone else's walk to support them to have it. And the closest one, they're not doing it right now. So oh. I'm still trying, though. Still trying. Okay. Yeah. We're working on Cape Breton. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I am, I guess another question if uh, alongside Kara's one is um, for any of our hike leader, uh, you know, walk leaders right now, um, uh, do you have someone or, cause I know we, we get inquiries uh, more often now than ever about someone uh, who, who's perhaps a uh, partner or parent or someone has uh, dementia and they're interested in seeing if the walk can be applied. So I am interested to see if anyone has seen, um, for those who have led walks or are leading walks, have seen um, that or experienced that yet. And, you know, some some questions about that. Um, this is one of, you know, one of the reasons we're so, it's so valuable to be able to work with uh, Alzheimer's is that, their client, you know, they, they kind of have the clientele that we don't even necessarily connect with on a regular basis, kind of more in the recreation world. <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful to be able to, uh, to kind of come together to learn and, and be able to uh, access some of those populations that we otherwise wouldn't um, kind of be able to reach. Yeah. And, you know, just being able to promote it. I know um, Catherine and I were talking um, about getting the word out there to people with dementia um, who are living independently um, and, and or are with a partner. And often, you know, both 
people want to get out and they want to walk. So you may have people coming to your walk who are, you know, they may, they may share with you that they have dementia, but they may not. So you may not know. You may have people in your group that have dementia, but haven't chose to share as well. That's should, our, should our posters say dementia friendly or something like that? I, well, we're going to talk more about that. And this is like, yeah. uh, gee, this hour has flown already, but uh, I, know. I guess the intention is kind of to, to start the conversation today. And then um, in, in Scotland, for instance, they have developed dementia friendly walks where it's kind of a designation we would kind of offer probably some additional um training for the walk leaders but then also some of those considerations on site that Kara mentioned briefly so there's a little bit of stuff that we want to be able to put in place um to, to make sure that but as you know as Kara mentioned is a wonderful point you know we I think what we're aiming towards is uh, a dementia friendly walk, but also a walk that fits all abilities, right? And by be doing a dementia friendly, it's also uh, friendly for uh, you everyone. Know, everyone. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, so that's definitely what we're shooting for. One of the things, like I would be interested in doing a walk like that, number one, I've worked with autistic ch children with autism and PEX cards are often given for um, what comes next. Mm -hmm. And I can see that being useful for the route. So we're gonna pass a church, we're gonna, and then you reverse it coming back mm -hmm. so that once they're on a walk, they may feel more uh, confident to do it on their own after a few times. And I think repeating the walk, you know, um, maybe five or six times will give help them to feel confident and having that little ring with the five cards on it or four cards whatever of what we pass so that they can get back so yeah yeah it, yeah that would be definitely useful for sure um you know it's that and then ashley has said the mouse yeah so amazing great transfer of resources definitely and it's interesting that you'd say that because we actually have um we have things called companion cards here um and they're for the person with dementia and they're also for the companion so that when they're out in the community just to say hey you know what i need a little bit of extra time when i'm at the checkout so it uh, says you know my companion has an illness that causes memory loss and confusion thank you for your understanding it changes the communication between mm -hmm. you know the cashier the bus driver the taxi driver whoever it might be once they realize that oh that person needs a you know a few extra minutes of my time i'm going to give it to them <laughs> and and pex cards for uh children with autism it allows them to be more autonomous in in their daily activity if you can give them, this is how you get dressed, you know, socks and underwear and so on. Um, and yeah, it just allows for more autonomy. I think that if we have um, individuals with dementia in our walking group, and whereas we are, are, are trained how to interact um, in a positive way, we are actually becoming teachers to those others in our group. Yes, um, you're modeling. We had a, an individual with dementia in the Hike the Highlands Festival. It's a, a yearly festival. Um, and this individual was coming for years before they began their journey with dementia. And it went through the group of regulars like, oh, they have dementia. And so people were interacting less with this individual because they weren't sure how to interact. So I think doing this dementia training with us as leaders is a positive step in the whole community. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It reduces the stigma. And, and the reason why the person would have fell back or those individuals fell back is because they weren't aware. They didn't understand. They didn't have the knowledge and they didn't have um, an understanding of how to support and how to interact. You know, it's, you're, you're supporting the same way you always have been. You're just slowing things down a bit, giving more time, using more nonverbal cues too, right? Um, yeah, it's it's just a different approach. It's a, a different way of approaching. And let's see. Yeah, so Ashley, is it? Yeah, I wonder if reaching out to assisted living homes would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and um, the assisted living homes, and yeah, they would have um, recreation therapists as well. I would think maybe maybe that would be more long term care facilities, but assisted living homes would definitely have recreate RTs on on uh, staff as well. I think. Yeah, we're starting to. Um... Yeah, we're starting to work with Northwood, for instance, um, mm -hmm. and having a walk leader come to Northwood once a week, and people want to come out for a walk, and starting to to broach those for sure. Excellent. But yeah, and, you know, there could be people in assisted living that could benefit from the walks for sure. Definitely, great ideas. Yeah. What would happen if someone um, came to the walk? without a support person and the individual maybe should have had a support person. Mm. So, maybe and that's a good that. question. It's yeah. a good question. Yeah. And so, and I think as part of the, the walk, you would go through sort of a consent form, right? You, you would have a consent form. So all of the walk participants would have sort of an agreement and a consent form and but having said that though leslie even though that consent form may be signed it's possible that they may attend on their own i know we um we run a program called minds in motion and it's an exercise program it's a sort of like an exercise and a social program um so they need to have a certain level of fitness in order to participate and they need to you know, have permission, they need to go and have an assessment through their family physician. So I think that would be the way to ensure that that person doesn't show up on their own. In fact, there may be some people who are living independently with dementia in the community that don't require, a, you know, a support person or a family member, something else to think about too. Yeah. And that would be clearly indicated on the um, the consent form. What's the form I'm thinking of? Catherine the waiver form yeah the participant a waiver. And waiver form. yeah like a waiver but a disclosure form a criteria form yeah exactly um yeah and certainly uh, just the practical terms and uh, um we'll have to close off here soon I think but um as far as we know we haven't had anyone uh kind of show up that is in that scenario and if anything like we're, we're you know we really want more people that perhaps could benefit from it and we hope that perhaps their caregiver can bring them but uh um but you know it is always a possibility but uh um it's something that we want to be able to put in place easily that um, they would have the support that they need and encourage their caregiver because the caregiver of course can benefit from being there too right and and being exactly. around other people and enjoy some other conversation and, and stuff too so we're really kind of promoting it that way too you know and and just sorry I'm gonna throw this question so how many of the the people who are in your walks or particip participating in your walks do they plan things outside of those walks? Have you seen that socialization outside of those walking groups, you know, occur? Yeah, I see a couple of head nods. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Joanne, you're muted there. <laughs> I'm really unaware of, of it. I know there were prior friendships where people joined the walk and then said to couples they know, oh, this is a great group, come and join, and we've gotten another couple or, oh, okay. or an individual join, but I know some of them definitely have led to more friendships and and several, you know, the, in, in some of the groups are widows or widowers and they've kind of lost that main social person. And then this has become a new uh, social uh, support for them, which is fantastic. So, it's, yeah, so that's huge. It's growing that social network, that circle. Right. Um, if we've learned anything through COVID, I mean, that lack of connection with each other was huge. It's you know, it had a huge mental you know, an impact on our mental wellness. And so to be able to bring people together to exercise, you know, and then to socialize as they're walking, I mean, it's just ticking off all those amazing things that um, build our wellness. So it's, yeah, it's wonderful. Exactly. It's good for will, new, new people in the community as well. Definitely, yeah. I will, I will say just Tuesday, our walk, one um, of the husbands uh, spoke up and said, I just want to say thank you for being here and doing this to me. Kate came in, I thought, you know, I walk anyway. It's not that big, but it was big to them. And so, yeah, 
I because just, it was accessible. You made that accessible. If he was alone and didn't have somebody to walk with and didn't feel comfortable walking on his own, you made that happen. Like this is making it happen. Those people yeah. that don't have that. It was a surprise, but it was a, a good surprise. Mm -hmm. Okay. And let's just see here. Yeah, okay. And if anybody has any other questions at all, Catherine, you know, you feel free to direct them my way and uh, I can talk to folks one on one and we can, you know, any, any uh, questions that may not have been addressed today, we can address them another time. Mm -hmm. And um, did you say there's a video that we can view or information on Autism Nova Scotia, is it? Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh. No, that would be the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia. There is a video specifically for the 10 symptoms and strategies for people with dementia. Okay. Yeah. I think I attached it in the inv invitation before today. Yeah. yeah. She should have it. Yeah. Thanks. But um, yeah, as I said, like Karen and I have been talking a while and just trying to work together and how to proceed with uh, with this and, and certainly... Um, the attention, uh, the intention, and if any of you would like to kind of work with us on it, we can have another conversation about how to proceed in terms of just getting what we need in place to um, to say that, you know, our walks are dementia friendly and stuff. So I'm delighted if any of you want to work on that. Sounds like maybe Joanne, maybe Leslie, everyone's a couple. <laughs> yeah. like, we'll, have another, we'll have another conversation just kind of strategizing and, and seeing what we has said what we need to put in place, whether it's a small toolkit, you know, a toolkit or a checklist or things like that. Yeah, it's too Super bad Leslie. And, it's too bad Leslie and I aren't closer together. Oh, <laughs> I so, in Cape Breton. Yeah, Leslie's in Cape Breton. Joanne, where are you? Berwick, no Berwick. Berwick. Okay, Berwick. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Well, we could at least uh, have some Zoom calls to begin with, anyway. <laughs> yes, for sure. I think I think it's this is a, a wonderful thing to have this inclusivity happening because I know with my mom it really improved her quality of life. We used to drag mm -hmm. her in her wheelchair everywhere. Yeah. And my brothers would say, You took mom where? You know, but but it it was fabulous for her. So I'm really glad to to see this happening. Uh, I will say I, I worked for grit which stood for getting ready for inclusion today was my employment. And it was uh, getting children with multiple disabilities mm -hmm. and medical issues ready for the school system oh, and right. getting them out to kindergarten and, and um, preschool or whatever programs mm -hmm. I could to, yeah, get them ready. So I've always had the interest. Excellent, Joanne. Teacher Joanne. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so Kara, I don't know if you wanted if you had any closing anything else. Oh, I'm just super excited to see that, you know, you 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 all came today to learn more and to share about your experience with dementia and just to see how we could possibly make some of the, the walking routes dementia friendly, but friendly to all. And I am super stoked if anybody wants to talk more about, you know, specifically looking at your group, one of your groups and, and um, inviting people with dementia, like being more intentional about promoting it to a person with dementia, then by all means, let's chat. Hmm. Sounds Keep awesome. the conversation going. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Um... Yeah, no, and I just like to thank you again, Kara. This has been uh, it's been magnificent. Lots, so much good, good information and and understanding, and uh, uh, taught in a very uh, easy to understand way. Appreciate that, and thank you for everyone for participating today, and um, again uh, sharing your own personal stories. So, um, as I said, we this is kind of a, a beginning conversation, and our attention will be to. Uh, um, to keep having them and and perhaps we we're talking about maybe a little pilot project or something in a small way start with a couple of walks and and build on uh, build on that um and uh, this will be recorded i'm going to start recording now um but we uh it is recording and it'll be on our um walk leader um homepage, Walk Leader resource page so if people if the people weren't able to join today or if you want to review it so but again Thank you all very much for, for taking the time and joining us today. And thanks again, Kara. Yeah, um, thank you. Fantastic.
Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>